Yes, so I'm delighted to be joined by Natasha Beaton Moore, who is a transhumanist writer and thinker, and very prominent within the movement. Um, and I say you've obviously been involved in a huge number of projects. So I know you're the a senior professor of graduate and undergraduate programs at the University of Advanced Technology. You're the co-editor of the Transhumanist Reader, um, classical and contemporary essays on science, technology, and the philosophy of the human future. But I guess the place to start is that. See, for someone who's been in the movement for so long, I mean, how have you found that the public reaction to transhumanist ideas has been changing over the years? You know, it's interesting that to, to from an anthropological perspective or a historical perspective, it's fascinating to see how people adapt to ideas where at first they're a bit shocked and stunned and, go, oh, no, we can't have that because by and large, humans, our species, we really don't like change. We like to get our ducks lined in a row and, and know where we're going, where we're headed, and, and knowing that we have a shelf life, we have to do this or that by a certain uh, time frame. So to totally disrupt that is um, unique. And the first reaction to the transhumanist agenda, uh, going back to the late 1980s through 1990s, let's say when the movement started in 1990, it, it was it was shocking, and there was a lot of um, angst, uh, disregard, lack of communication and understanding through the the media vehicles or platforms, and those of us who were speaking about transhumanist ideas and setting up the principles, the the tenets, the the core philosophical uh, parameters, and as well as the the practice of uh, transhumanism, how we live our daily lives, how we prepare for the future, critical thinking, um, you know, constantly advancing and, and re-educating ourselves, knowing that there are no absolutes and no definitive truths to constantly be questioning what we're espousing, what we're talking about, not only in the technological realm, but in the scientific realm and the humanities and uh, looking at the, the whole scope of humanity. Today is a different story. People have adapted. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the terminology that we had used in the early 1990s through the early 21st century had not quite gone mainstream, but they are now. And people yeah, are more yeah. apt to pay attention. So to answer your question succinctly, uh, transhumanism was a, um, a disruptive worldview that shook uh, you know, humanity and, and society at its core. But now people have adapted to this uh, disruptive concept. And as we know, as entrepreneurs, innovators in the business world, we talk about disruptive technologies, disruptive businesses, um, where we have to pivot. So I think society, um, certainly in the areas where transhumanist ideas are um, fluid, have had to adapt. And I think many people are starting to go, oh, and so that's a very good thing. I mean, I've, definitely it seems over the past few years, trans, the transhumanist movement has been growing quite a bit and growing quite a bit in status and becoming kind of more politically engaged. Um, does it almost feel to you that they're kind of, you're, you're on the verge of a major breakthrough moment? So in, in the same way, the idea of, say, universal basic income um, was quite a, a relative niche idea until Andrew Yang came along. And you kind of feel that, you know, that there'll come a point where, um, where transhumanism will become kind of a household name. Yes, I do. But I think it's not uh, within the political realm. I think it's within the social realm. I think that the only way that transhumanism as a worldview can become a, a welcome practice and um, ethical standpoint, let's call it, um, is in social behavior and social understanding. And that that would be kind of a, a uh, paradigmatic shift in um social understanding and consciousness, basically, to want to live longer and to want to live healthier and to do what it takes through ethical use of technology and evidence-based science to bring this about uh, really uh, rubs our species at its very core because as animals, we have a limited lifespan. We have a time frame or a shelf life. And um, mitigating that and understanding that aging is a disease uh, it kind of unravels things. So I, I think it's going to take a little bit of time. We certainly need laws, uh, rules, uh, legislation, uh, regulations um, to look at how we can best do that. And I think that then you have to go to each particular country's or government's um, protocol 
everyone has a different model. I think that we do need a global model, however, and that's what I'm currently working on with a concept I um, am writing right now called metahumanism. So it's beyond transhumanism. So I take a look at um, some of the areas where transhumanism has recently fallen short. It wasn't like this in the early days. It's gotten, it's kind of mutated more towards politics than society and the humanities. And I'd like to bring it back to where its core values have been and where it can do the most, let's say, say good in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, say, well, one thing I've always found very strange is when you talk to people about radical life ex um, extension, some people are very distressed at the idea, which, which seems very counterintuitive. I mean, you know, we, we evolved as a species to want to survive. I mean, why do you think that is? Do you think it's purely religious or do you think there's more to it than that? Um, do you, do you, sorry, <laughs> Kate. Yeah, I, I think that you nailed it. I, I think that it is largely religious, but I think it is also largely innate that um, somehow we've been, well, not somehow through mythology. I mean, you take a, a look at basic lore and the narratives that we've um, been fed based on early writings about what is and is not, you know, within our reach. Um, we fall back that now we meaning largely society, not you and I, perhaps, but a largely uh, so I think it's the narrative is ingrained in our in culturalization, no matter what culture, it seems to be endemic across cultures, across uh, landscapes uh, geographically. Um, yeah. Now, given that, plus the fact that the largest percentage of people on our planet are religious, and that's divided between some very astute religious practices, um, that that puts a damper on it too. However, it doesn't prevent it. I mean, it would be interesting as we're seeing religious doctrines changing a little bit to include life extension and changing a little bit, as we've seen, to include maybe divorce, the Catholic Church. At first, divorce was never permitted. And, and, you know, now we're seeing, well, yeah, that's OK. And we're seeing different, you know, social um, models that have shifted based on people's needs. We'll see the the um, the model about death and heaven and hell slightly shifting as people want to live longer. You know, heaven can be prolonged. It doesn't have to happen right now. <laughs> so if you believe in that or the, an afterlife, let's just say that it doesn't have to happen at exactly a certain time, maybe instead of 90 as a, um, um, a lifespan, maybe 300 if you want to go that route. So we'll see, um, um, I wouldn't even call it a trending, I would say a realization that religions have to keep up with the, the state of society and their members within that, that sector. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's almost a mismatch between um, kind of human biology as in, as as we evolved and the technology we now have? So in, in a sense, obviously, we evolved to be very tribal, quite somewhat inclined towards violence and so on, which may have been a good thing, you know, 20,000 years ago. But now when you combine that with nuclear weapons and, and the potential of chemical and biological weapons could potentially be, be devastating. I mean, do you think that's one of the fundamental transhumanist arguments is that we kind of need to modify humanity or we'll end up destroying ourselves? OK, so what you're saying is that one of the, 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 the core reasonings or critical thinking um, topics is that we have to augment, upgrade, enhance, or we will, uh, our species will um, die out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we kind of have to modify certain parts of our behavior, which might have made sense in kind of, you know, evolutionary terms thousands and thousands of years ago, but which are now very dangerous when combined with nukes and uh, biological weapons and so on. I think, but it, I don't think it's any more dangerous than it was hundreds and hundreds of years ago throughout time. I mean, even the hunter-gatherers had to, you know, survive. That's, you know, the, the instinct of the reptilian brain or the brainstem and fight or flight. You know, it's the... The bigger animals were coming after them, so they had to run. Um, maybe a bigger animal um, in the um, 20th century was nuclear weapons. Maybe the bigger animal today is artificial intelligence. So no matter what that bigger animal is, we will still have to apply um, certain um, behavioral skills. And let's say perhaps those behavioral skills will require that we 
upgrade ourselves um, from the fight or flight to a, a better reasoning and understanding, more empathy, uh, a sense of, of, of basic understanding about the diversity of so many different people in so many different circumstances. But most importantly, the critical thinking skills are uh, essential along with empathy, of course. Um, benevolence is is a, a very important um, um, understanding to have. Um, uh, the, so we need to become more warm and fuzzy as a people. <laughs> At the same time, we need to certainly upgrade our cognitive abilities because uh, we've been sequestered to um, those myths again that we can't do it or that we have a, a limit of what we can do. So with the aid of AI, we will be able to um, perform um, cognitive skills far better than we have today. And, and certainly we need AI to gather all the data and sort it out so we can make decisions. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, you know, you take a look at the biology, which you mentioned, um, we certainly do need to um, upgrade our biology. And I've uh, been speaking about this for 30 some years. And the fact that our, our biology is vulnerable. We exist on a daily basis with an incredible vulnerable uh, vehicle, our bodies, that anything could be go wrong at any time. Um, we may have a disease and we don't know about it until it's almost too late or too late. Um, so then we have preventative medicine, we're looking at um, personalized medicine, better ways to use AI to sort through our DNA, to look at our, uh, you know, what's going on in our body and, and to assess that more aptly. And doctors need that in order to prescribe um, ways for us to be healthier. But it's not just that. We really need to uh, engineer our genes. And uh, while there's no absolute gene therapy today that can be used. Of course, stem cells are used in some areas, but we need to be careful about using broad terms like stem cells because stem cells uh, don't always go to the area they need to go to. They can cause a tumor. There are downsides to these, but I, I wouldn't say don't you know, go to a doctor who is skilled at stem cell therapy. Um, go to a doctor who's skilled at stem cell therapy if you get to that point that you need it. As far as genetic engineering, uh, we've seen um, great work done with, with certain diseases like Tay-Sachs and sickle cell anemia, certain cancers, certain diseases that handicap us. If we could remove those genes, and we've seen people who have a gene for breast cancer or ovarian cancer have those genes removed, that's um, commonplace today to know about it. Not to do it necessarily, but to know about it. Other gene therapies are in the works, and um, there, there still needs to be far more work in this area. And I think most of us will be uh, undergoing gene therapy as soon as it comes online. Um, and as needed, again, as needed. Um, you see people taking so many vitamins and over-exercising their body and, and struggling to stay in that realm of what they think is health. But what is health for one person is not necessarily health for another. So I, I say, be careful. <laughs> it's very interesting that you mentioned the vulnerability of the human body. I know, I know you've um, written quite a lot in particular about whole body prosthetics. I mean, what do you think is the kind of the, the most realistic, say, mid-term way of, of overcoming our kind of, you know, our, our the, the vulnerability of our bodies? Is, is it a whole body? Is it whole body prosthetics, or is it mind uploading? Some combination of the two. Uh, I mean, those are two totally different areas, although they, in my design, Primo post um, it does have the, the metabrain, which would be an upload, download, crossload vehicle. I don't agree with just uploading. I think that I'm uploading right now with you. I'm sending messages to you through the internet, through a cloud or whatever system that you're employing to uh, um, take your data and sort it and preserve it for you know, exhibition later on. So we're constantly uploading um, in our smart devices, sending out zeros and ones. And I call this the exoperipheral nervous system. So we have our central nervous system, our peripheral nervous system, and I coined the phrase exoperipheral nervous system to deal with the zeros and ones, which are part of our identity, We're already expanding ourselves beyond the body. Okay, so what yeah. is the next step? What is the most important thing? Well. 
to have a healthy vehicle, have this biological body as healthy as possible, as durable and sustainable as possible. But I don't think that is where we're going to be, say, in 50 some years from now. I think we'll be looking at alternative bodies. And we can see that really growing in the field of prosthetics, whereas my whole body prosthetic is an alternative body and it's based on supposition and conjecture. A lot of the ideas I had in 1996, I think it was when I designed that, I had a very um, strong scientific and technological team working with me. Marvin Minsky, father of AI, Eric Drexler, father of nanotechnology, Max Moore for you know, transhumanist perspective, Greg Fay for looking at um, you know, cryogenics and, and organ transplant, looking at um, what is possible, even uh, Ralph Merkel for encryption. He created the Merkel tree, for, which is the beginning of blockchain. And very few people credit him for that, but he deserves to be credited for it. So blockchain was included in there in some way, but mostly it's the encryption, protecting our identity. If we're sending out ourselves through our smart devices and the internet, and in so many different ways, um, the internet of things of the cloud, we do need to think about security and how do we encrypt and secure our identity. There's a rise in identity theft. There's a rise in, in um, hacking almost every secure system known today. So then we have those who are skilled at um, uh, pen testing or penetration testing or vulnerabilities trust, uh, testing within the, you know, the um, codes. We also need it in the codes of our body. We need vulnerabilities testing. And that's um, the area I'd like to see more developed uh, with our, our genes and, and certain therapies. The, um, I think more fundamentally that we, we, it is essential that our, our memories be stored someplace. And currently our memories are stored in our brain, but that still is vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we have hackers all the time in our brains and those are called viruses and disease. Disease is constantly hacking our, our um, neurons and, and the, the, the substances within those electrical charges and the synapses and our dendrites and, and where memory is stored. So in order to protect that, we need to have copies of it. We need to back it up and you see, certain um, industry um, uh, efficients like Google looking at um, how to back up the brain. So it's not just uploading per se, it's backing up the brain, I think is the most consequential thing to do for, for ourselves. We can have different bodies. So with the field of prosthetics advancing in design and having haptic systems, uh, not only AI, but um, neurological communication with our um, prosthetic parts or limbs, uh, take that steps further to look at the whole body. And that's getting to, into the realm that I created for the, the future human body vehicle. Uploading indeed is part of that, but I, I see it differently than those who talk about uploading. I see uploading as a uh, unnecessary um, uh, technology for not only backing up the brain, but as a, a means for us to go into different environments. I mean, we're currently in this, uh, this uh, physical material world, this biosphere. There are other worlds yet to be explored just as we're looking at space exploration. Another area is virtuality, augmented reality, all these other systems, even in games, to go into games and participate as yourself, taking on an avatar or maybe um, something else. We don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned about um, kind of, you know, mind uploading and downloading. I mean, I know this is a very philosophical question, um, but to what extent is it still you? If, if you upload your mind to something else and then download it somewhere else, is it still the same person or, or, or is it kind of a copy of you? Excellent question. This is, this is a very fundamental <laughs> question. And the answer, I would say, is if there's continuity of who you are, then it is you. If there's a break in continuity, then it may not be you. For example, if I'm me on a daily basis, I go to sleep and I wake up and I'm, I remember what I did yesterday and I, I look at my plans for what I want to achieve tomorrow and there's a continuity of that, that makes sense. If I was to wake up and there was another Natasha that's in a virtual habitat, it's still me, part of me, until it has an experience that the core me doesn't have. 
And once it has an experience that I, the core me doesn't have, it becomes something else. And with that something else, could go on and separate and divide. So this is a very basic fundamental question in looking at the future of, of personhood or identity and looking at the different modalities we could exist within biosphere, computational systems, virtual systems, and systems that we are platforms that we haven't even thought of yet. So that continuity is important, in which case it would mean that we need one core identity and then sub-identities. So the core identity would have to be aware of what the sub-identities are doing. And they are um, part and parcel to the core identity. And the, the example that I use in explaining this is right now I'm talking to you and I'm here devoting my time to you as focusedly as I can. However, <laughs> I can't stop the fact that in, I, my dog is over there on the sofa and he's looking at me as a cutie pie and I want to give him a kiss or smile at him. At the same time, I'm realizing today is the day um, I need to clean the house. Um, I have to um, plan a photo shoot for my new agent. I have to um, uh, trim the trees. I love gardening. So I need to trim the trees in the backyard because they're blooming too quickly and they're weighing the trees down. So all these other thoughts are going on in my head, but they're still part of me. So if we yeah, take yeah. that and expand on it, part of me could go over there and pet the dog and give him a hug and a kiss. Another part of me could go outside and trim my oleander trees and my rose garden. Um, another part of me could be cleaning the house, but those would be sub aspects of me, but still in the field of psychology, we would have to understand that a fractured identity would lead to schizophrenia or psychosis. So we need to be very careful about that. And just to add a little footnote here, we're already seeing that in certain fields like gaming and uh, when people spend too much time in other habitats, environments, whether it's being a couch potato watching TV and, and starting to think that you're really in that soap opera, that that character, that soap opera is your friend. I mean, we start getting false sense of reality. Hold on just a minute. Alexa? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I mean, Alexa chimes into a conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good illustration of what we're talking about. So, I mean, it's very interesting about kind of virtual worlds and um, the extent to which you could you could live inside those. I mean, I mean, do you think that in the future, potentially, there will be people who primarily exist in virtual worlds, whose, whose physical body or, you know, perhaps just the brain plugged in somewhere is, is a very small part of their existence? I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm not an expert in psychology, um, so I, I don't want to tread in areas that I, I don't have the correct terminology or the, the study. But just as a, a person who observes this, um, I know that we can get lost in other narratives. For example, I love romance movies. I love turn of the century movies. I love Downton Abbey. I watch movies um, that are have those type of narratives, no matter what country I spend you know, time watching uh, South Korean movies, Japanese movies, um, even Afghanistan, no, Pakistan movies, um, uh, Turkish movies. So, but they all have a different type, slightly different type of uh, customs in their society. And I study that and I watch it. And I notice that each one believes that their reality is reality, but their reality is based on their customs, their socialization or um, enculturization. And while it's working within the parameters of their lifestyle, you take them out of that lifestyle, you put them in a different one, by and large, people will be lost. Yeah. And yeah. so that means that we're kind of already living in a dream world as our culture society builds up the parameters for us to exist within. Taken out of that, let's just, for lack of a better term, let's just say comfort zone, we would be um, unraveled. So one of the, the, the um, elements of transhumanist agenda that I really like is that adapting to change, being able to adapt and to understand that Anything can happen. And we've already seen, you know, the fact that we've all had to adapt to this pandemic and restructure our lives to be on lockdown or to solve quarantine, to not shake hands and not hug and kiss and all these things that we might have done before. 
We've, we know that there is a danger there. My hope, if there's any silver lining to this, my hope is that we realize the vulnerability of us anyway, that we didn't need a pandemic to remind us that we are vulnerable animals that, and contagion does happen. Not only contagion with viruses, but mimetic engineering as a contagion being influenced by how other people speak and talk and what they claim they're doing. Yeah. So yeah. someone could just be, you know, come across as very knowledgeable and skilled and have their company and their CEO of it and they have their everything website looks great. But where are they really? I mean, take a look at the story about even uh, you know Jeffrey um, Jeffrey Weinstein. Take a look at um, um, Epstein, who um, associated with with Harvard University and wealthy people, and Stephen Hawking, and and just so many world icons. But they were cheaters, and they used their money to pay their way into a social network. But we didn't know who they really were or what was really going on until it was exposed. Another example is in the medical industry, looking at doctors, uh, a dentist who will do a rhinoplasty. And you don't want your dentist doing a, a surgery on the <laughs> nose or breast implants. So there are com cosmetic surgeons who get some kind of certification or certificate, and then you find out they're putting cement in your butt. You know, it's like, that's horrible. And then um, more seriously, um, Elizabeth Holmes with the blood. Um, there's a documentary out called Bad Blood, and it tells about Elizabeth Holmes, who claimed to have invented a um, a machine that could take a drop of blood and do everything that six vials of blood do, um, looking at your blood work, and that she people invested in her company. And there's a big lawsuit right now. But we we must remember these things. Not that we want to gossip about anyone or shame anyone. That's not the point. The point is the transhumanist critical thinking characteristic means that we need to be careful and not just say, oh, life is great. Life is wonderful. Let's all live a long time and do all these different um, protocols and vitamins and whatnot. It doesn't work for everyone. And the yeah. best thing yeah. we can do is to stay alive, do everything we can to to make a transhumanist dharma or practice our daily work and to spread love and, and all of that warm, fuzzy, lovely stuff. But at the same time, um, use our scruples about things. How far is too far? What is within um, a logical framework for what you need at this time in your life? And that changes. 20 year old will need something different than a 70 year old. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier that there's obviously a big division within the world transhumanist movement right now about engagement with politics. I mean, what do you think is the most practical way for transhumanists to try and kind of build the world they want to build? Um, I mean, if, if it's not politics, is, is it more engaging with the science directly or is it trying to get policy change through some other way? What, what, what's, what's kind of, what can transhumanists actually do? I think that we need to get away from um, overemphasizing politics. And I'll explain why. The, um, the transhumanist agenda does need laws and policies and legislation and rules. Yeah. That's given. We live within countries and countries are run by governments. Those in leadership roles in governments are elected or they're, you know, somehow find their way in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that is part of politics. There's a difference between politics and a political party. And there's a difference between understanding the socio-political economic structures of any given region or country or government versus a political party. For example, in the United States, we have two well-known political parties, the Democratic Party, which is not only not does not always uh, promote democracy, and we have the Republican Party, which does not always promote democracy. Both of them are part of a democracy because we're in a democracy here in the United States, as you are probably in your country. So that's a given. We all live in a democracy, those of us in the Western world. So moving that aside, then we look at what parties stand for. Um, the Republican Party in the United States stands for certain things. And then the uh, Democratic 
party stands for other things, but really they all stand for the same thing. We all want to preserve our rights, our freedoms. We all want to have a healthy economy, a prosperous society, and help people um, get away from the um, the opioids, the, the, the drug cartels, the unemployment, the suffering, the pain. That's what we all want. Approaching it is probably similar the same. No matter if you have a Democratic president or a Republican president or a libertarian president or a socialist president, it doesn't matter. You still have governing bodies. Here we have the Senate and we have the House. So there still has to be, I mean, Congress and the Senate. So there still has to be, you know, governing bodies and they're comprised of, of diversity. They're from various parties. Okay, with that said, what is the problem then? The problem is that parties, political parties, often are run to divide. My, my party is better than your party. My view is better than your party. We're right, you're wrong. That is not transhumanist from the get-go. Uh, okay, that's interesting. If I'm right, you're wrong is not transhumanist. Transhumanist thinking, the transhumanist worldview globally supports critical thinking. Critical thinking is not, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. Now, debates and discussions are good. Debate, you can have someone say, these are my views, these are my moral codes, this is what I think needs to happen. The other one says, well, these are my views, my moral codes, this is what I think needs to happen. But by and large, an ethical outcome is what we're looking for, not any personal morals. Yeah. So yeah. that is the problem. So if you get too far into politics, you're not dealing with policies, laws, and legislation. You're dealing with one group saying, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And yeah. that is divisive. And we do not, transhumanism is not about divisiveness. So when we have political parties, whether it's the United States Transhumanist Party, the uh, United Kingdom Transhumanist Party, the Techno Progressives, the, uh, whatever the group is, that's great. I value all of them. However, um, I don't see anyone that is looking, that is working with the government's within their, their respective countries. Uh, yeah. The government, yeah. unless and until policies and laws and legislations are pitched and respected and supported and implemented, it's just my group versus your group. So I don't think that's the route. I think the route that, that needs to occur, and this is based on logic, you find gaps in society or gaps in industry, and then you can bridge those gaps. The gap that's missing in industry is a society of people that want to see life extensions being a healthy thing that support aging as a disease. And until we can make that paradigmatic shift in people's thinking, politics is just politics. I mean, political parties are just political parties. They're not making a dent. Yeah. So yeah. the grassroots is, is probably one of the best ways to go and then find the uh, angel investors and the venture capitalists to invest in projects like the X Prize does. And I think the X Prize is not involved in politics. And look at all the great work the X Prize has done. I mean, wow. I mean, there is a model for you of an entrepreneurial, innovator, innovative uh, type of way to deal with the problems in the world, which they are doing. They're not just dealing with the problems in Culver City, California, where their, their, their central office is located. They're dealing with problems around the world in developing countries and trying to help solve those problems, not only here on Earth, but with the X Prize for space, with the rocket boosters. And so you're seeing that are they wasting their I shouldn't say wasting excuse me are they spending their time <laughs> pushing one political view over another political view no no they're doing something so I've I've been involved in politics in the past I ran on the green I was a member of the green party in Los Angeles in the 1990s and I ran as um, county council person for Los Angeles County I won by a landslide and so I know what it's like to to run to give speeches to uh, have an agenda, mine was the transhumanist technology to um, clean up the environment. Well, back then it was like, oh no, but now we're looking at how nanotechnology could help clean up the environment, how artificial intelligence could give us the data to be better able to assess where there is a climate fluctuations and what we can do to um, ameliorate them or mitigate them. So I'm more interested in 
let's see, people doing things than um, politicization of transhumanism. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I think it's I think it it lessens the value of transhumanism, which is a worldview. It's not a political party. I mean, do you think the kind of the current batch of world left Western leaders? I mean, do you think they appreciate just how dramatic technological change could be over the coming, say, fifty years or so? Is, is there kind of a disconnect between the scientific community and the current political class? There is a huge disconnect. Huge. In fact, it's so large that this morning I spent a couple of hours communicating with three different people at the World Economic Forum and um, uh, pitching an idea on longevity. And um, I see where there's a gap. There's there's no one who's an expert on longevity at the World Economic Forum. And so I pitched that to, to uh, three different um uh, individuals deeply involved in, in in that organization. I think that I, you know, looking at different organizations, um, seeing how we can help them better learn and know, and then uh, then the governing bodies, the leaders, go to those events like Davos and listen to what's going on. So until we can wrap around this way and come in and have those groups respect um the ideas that stem from uh, the transhumanist agenda, but we're just like talking to ourselves or talking to each other and speak, you know, preaching to the choir. And we don't need to preach to the choir. We need to get out and figure out the best way to um, engineer these ideas so they, they are uh, more positive rather than frightening to the general public. Yeah. I mean, I guess one issue that's going to become more prominent as kind of some of these technologies start um, coming around is kind of, I guess we call bioconservatism, people who, either for religious reasons or for some other moral reason, um, reject the idea of, of modifying themselves. I mean, how do you think a, a society would would integrate both people who are kind of have our current biology and people who've advanced some way beyond them? I think it would. It was daunting in in the in the twentieth century, especially in the, in the 1990s. In the early twenty first century, it was still a little bit daunting. I don't think it is so much today because we've seen such progress based on hope, and that progress has really turned things around. Um, one out of every what eight women will get breast cancer. So we do need to engineer our genes. I mean, that's kind of yeah. Um, the same would be for men with prostate cancer, but prostate cancer is not a death sentence like breast cancer is. Um, you can live with prostate cancer for a while and, and, you know, with treatment and whatnot. Breast cancer, if you don't, if you get it too late, then it's pretty serious. But even cancers today have been um, great strides, great successes with the, you know, the different therapies for that. Um, I think that the reason why there was such um, bad feeling of uncertainty with genetic engineering, um, especially in the United States, was largely due to President George W. Bush's bioethics committee, where you had uh, Dr. Hulbert, um, Dr. Leon Cass, uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama. Those three stand out as the primary um, advocates against transhumanism specifically yeah. Yeah. and against any tampering with um, our uh, genetic makeup, and the the reasoning there was that we carry some kind of X factor, and that if we modify our genetic makeup, we would be um, affecting that unknown, unseen, hypothetical X factor. And I think that X factor tied into their religious leanings, and I certainly do respect their views, um, but their personal moral views and religious views have no place in bioethics. Ethics is separate from morality. Morals are our personal views, our beliefs based on our choices we make and our experiences in life. Ethics ties into um, the more rigor of laws and policies and legislation. So um, I think that has been swept aside. That's no longer a big issue. And um, now the issue is, yes, genetic engineering is something we need. However, where how can it be done safely, ethically, and um, how can we best uh, ensure that when someone goes to their doctor, they're not selling, you know, something on the side that is, <laughs> you know, like I mentioned with the, you know, 
a dentist doing rhinoplasty. I mean, it just, you know, so we need, people need to be educated. We don't want the FDA here in the United States, I don't know uh, what your organization is, the Federal Drug Administration here is very, very strict. And it's just, it's starting to become a little bit wiser, let's say, um, but it's your body and it's your choice. And I truly believe in that. As long as um, it's the, the, the topic there is morphological freedom. So if you want to alter your body, um, change your body, that's your choice, as long as it doesn't harm or affect anyone else. Likewise, no one should ever be coerced into altering their body. If you want to remain a human, a homo sapiens sapiens, and that's what you want, a totally biological animal, that's your choice. And for goodness yeah. sakes, yeah. let's respect people who, ha who want that. Um, life extension and enhancement is not for everyone, but for those who do opt in for it, that's their choice. And no one ought to tell them they can't do it. So then it becomes self-responsibility. So how, now here's the gap that needs, that we need to address. How do we help people? How do we educate people to be smarter about where they're going and who they're speaking to and who they're listening to or who they're reading about genetic engineering or any type of therapy, stem cell and otherwise, or who to go to, what doctor to go to. So that is something that's missing that is very much needed. Um, so, yeah, and people can talk a good talk. You know, you can you know, drop six syllable words and sound really smart. But unless you have the knowledge, you're going to be found out. And so uh, I hasten to say that all of us need to be careful about what we're espousing, what we're claiming, what we're talking about. Because people listen. It's just like recently um, President Trump um, mentioned how we should maybe use uh, talking about disinfectants. Well, people misunderstood him thinking that he was saying you should drink disinfectants. People actually called up their doctors and said, well, should I drink my, my, you know, ammonia or what my chloride? Yeah. No, I mean, so you can't even tease about this or be flip. We have to be very serious when we're talking about genetic engineering um, and, and not boast too much, be, be humble. And I think that there's a level of humility that we that would really benefit us. And I, I'd like to see the transhumanist agenda and the worldview of transhumanism start to um, cop to that, maybe be more mindful of that level of uh, integrity and humility that is, is so much needed when you get to be in a leadership role, which transhumanism is getting to that point where people are starting to listen and pay attention. We want to make sure that the message is being delivered with authenticity and sincerity and not with hype yeah i just want to find a question so i would like to kind of end on a, on a on a very positive note um so of the various obviously transhumanists are involved in um developing all sorts of technologies and are interested in all sorts of different technologies i mean which is kind of the area that interests you the most which, which is what's the thing about the future that excites you the most oh gosh <laughs> i'm a, a, yeah, I'm a big <laughs> Um, I would like to totally re-engineer my body, and but that's nothing new. I'm known for that since the 1990s, um, but it's not available yet. So I'd like to have a, a whole new body that's um, not just genetically engineered, that has uh, smart devices. It's, a, it's smoothly integrated with not only narrow AI, but AGI. Um, and I'd like to have of uh, um, that meta brain that I, I mentioned in my work, where I have AI working with me like a best friend or a cohort, or you know, um, my, um, you know, you have your unconscious or your subconscious that that angel on my shoulder, that AI on my shoulder that's going, oh, yeah, think twice about <laughs> that, or yeah, that's uh, I support you one hundred percent. Makes me think of my mother who said, you know, you're the captain of your ship and the master of your fate, or. Master of your ship, captain of your, I think it's captain of your ship and master of your fate. Yeah. Go out there and soar. And my mother always supported me um, being at the forefront. And um, so I love that you can do it. You can, you know, we need more positive support from people all around us. The um, And that split because that would allow me to go out into space. I've been a space enthusiast for, um, gosh, long time. And 
I was with the first group of adults that went to the new space camp at the United States Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama, Tranquility Base. Um, I was there with astronaut trainers and I was an educator uh, performer there. And um, so I did that training and I loved it. Um, I would I would love to go out into space and um, be the first transhumanist in space. As a matter of fact, I just realized that when I wrote the transhuman manifesto, well, that became the transhumanist manifesto, um, that got on board the Cassini Huggins spacecraft. Uh-huh. And it was they they had a disc on board with writings, you know from antiquity and images and symbols and if any alien got it, they would you know know something about it. And fortunately, I submitted my, the Transhuman Manifesto to the, um, it was the European Space Society, along with the United States, the, NASA, and yeah. it got accepted yeah. on that disc. And so the, the term transhuman um, about humanity and, and longevity um, has gone out into our solar system. And I'm very proud of that. I, I've never highly promoted that. You know, it's, um, didn't see any need to, but I guess it is it is noteworthy, I suppose. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Cool. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Let's see, Natasha, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so okay. much for your time. Thank um, you.